everybody. As promised, uh, we are here with 2004 World Series of Poker main event world champion, among other many great things, uh, Greg Raymer, and also joined by Rob Washam and John Somsky and hopefully a few other folks. Uh, but Greg, first of all, just thank you so much for taking the time to call in. My pleasure. I'm glad to be on the show, Steve. And now you you just landed in Vegas, right? I literally just took the clothes and stuff out of my suitcases. I'm you know in my room and you know getting ready for the month and a half. Oh, that that is so exciting! So we're recording this on May 27th. It might be released a bit later, but uh, we're just on the front end of the 2019 World Series. So, Greg, you're saying you're like six weeks out there. How long are you going to spend? Yeah, I won't be heading back until like middle of July. Okay, and so what does that mean for you? What sort of the schedule look like as far as what you're planning on playing? Anything and everything? Well, basically, it's as much as I can, and, and hopefully I have as few entries as possible just because that means I'm making more day twos and day threes and stuff like that. For sure. Now, you are uh, – we're, we're actually based out of Minnesota, and I know you have Minnesota connections. Talk a, Just give us a little bit of a background on, you know, you growing up kind of in the Midwest, the U of M – uh, what's your what's your story kind of growing up pre uh, pre poker world? Well, I've lived lots of places, and uh, one of them was Minnesota for six years. I moved there after I got my bachelor's degree in chemistry, and I got a master's in biochemistry at the U, and then my law degree at the U, and then I worked at a couple different places as an attorney. But uh, my childhood, I was literally—I mean, I wasn't didn't really live there much, but I was born in North Dakota. My dad was still in the Air Force. And when I was much less than a year old, he moved back to Michigan where he was from, lived there till I was 10, uh, did my middle school years in uh, Florida, high school outside St. Louis, and undergrad in Rolla, Missouri. And now since 2005, I've lived in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, but might be uh, relocating soon, actually. Oh, is that right? Is there, a, is there a breaking news that we should be aware of? Uh, I mean, I, we haven't figured it out 100% yet. Um, we, I was living in Connecticut working as a patent attorney for Pfizer when I won the main event. And then I started representing an online site and I was traveling a lot. And at one point, my wife says, you know, look, at you, you're gone half the time. We can live anywhere near an airport. I want better weather. <laughs> and we ended up moving to Raleigh, North Carolina. We had looked at it fairly closely at a previous time when I had interviewed for a job there and it just seemed like a really nice place to live. And so we ended up going there, even though there's no poker in the area and uh, it was a great place for our daughter to grow up, but she's now uh, just graduated from university of Michigan and Hmm. intends to live her life in Manhattan. So we don't need to stay in, in Raleigh any longer. And my wife has decided, despite the weather, she'd rather be closer to her sister in Michigan. Oh, okay. Well, if you, you know, if you really want better weather, there's a, the, the house right across the road from us about an hour North of Minneapolis is, is open right now. So it's for sale. So, I mean, I think that's a great spot for you. If you want nicer weather. You know, we sold our house already because we knew we were going to move and we knew it would take a while. And as soon as we sold it, we were like, oh, thank God, we don't ever want to have a house again. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, because, well, you know, Minnesota. I'll probably, be a, I'll probably be a lifetime renter, you know. Yeah, there's some, there's some value in that. I, but Minnesota for nine months out of the year is just, you know, stunningly cold. And I think you'd really appreciate it. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say nine months. I mean, you know, oh, five, six months. But to be honest, you know, if I'm going to get much further north than, than North Carolina, it, it reaches a point where it's like, hey, you know, you really don't want to go outdoors. I mean, whether it's 30 or minus 30. So what's really the big difference, you know? Yeah, it is sort of redundant. <laughs> so, so okay, so Michigan, maybe you want to be close. She wants to be closer to the sister. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Fossil Man. So, you know, I've read a little bit about it, but I'd like to hear the the story from your mouth, kind of the the story behind the the fossils uh, that seem to be, you know, part of your, your brand and part of your world. Well, um, what happened really was I didn't have either of those brands. I was playing poker. I was still a low limit player. And uh, we were living in San Diego at that time. Actually, my wife took me to this rock and mineral show because she wanted to look at some jewelry. And I bought a fossil. 
you know, this one guy, his booth, he was selling fossils. And so I picked one up because I thought it'd be a good card protector. I thought it was kind of cool and it wasn't very expensive. And the people at the poker room I played at in Oceanside, California were like, Ooh, what is that? And when I told them it was 330 million years old, some of them were like, wow, that must be worth a fortune. And so I kind of saw an opportunity and I bought more fossils and started selling them at the table when I would play. <laughs> and so then I picked up the nickname and, you know, that's, that's the history of it. I mean, a lot of people though, out in the public are like, Oh, you're, you know, you're, they think the name is from those glasses I used to wear. Um, but those aren't fossils per se. Those are actually like lizard eye holograms. Right. And, and that was just like a joke thing. I was, playing the main event for the first time in 2002. And I was with my family at Disney World uh, like a month or two beforehand. And my wife and daughter always have to stop in the gift shops. And we had done the Tower of Terror ride at Disney World, and which you know, it's one of the more, you know, it's one of the newer rides, so to speak. I, you know, they're smart now. They have you like, you have to walk through the gift shop to get out of the ride. <laughs> Right. So, of course, we're spending time there. And while I'm waiting for them to do their thing, I see these, you know, little rack of these hologram glasses with different things on them. And and I thought, oh, you know, I never really wear sunglasses at the table, but it might be kind of funny. Like if I get involved in a big hand, I'll pull these out and put them on. And then halfway through day one, I, I get involved in a big pot and my opponent is tanking and he's like looking down, he's counting his chips and I'm sitting, you know, we're both at the farthest parts of the table from each other. And so I like pulled those glasses out and put them on and was staring at him. And then when he finally looked up, you know, 20, 30 seconds later, he just like jolted, you know, like, <laughs> you know, it was like, you know, he's being knocked backwards, you know, like, Whoa, you know, like what the, you know, and, right. and he almost, I mean, he literally, he would have fallen over in his chair if he, and, you know, like used his feet, you know, underneath the bottom of the table to catch himself. <laughs> and, uh, and then he kind of like seemed all freaked out and he ended up folding. And I thought, well, maybe there's more to this than just a one time joke. And I would not wear them most of the time, but as soon as I entered the pot, I would put them on and then I wouldn't take them off until the hand was over. <laughs> is, is that something that you still, still do? Well, it's not that I wouldn't, do it or mind doing it, but I haven't done it for a long time, mostly because it's just too easy to misread the board if you're not someplace really well lit. Oh, okay. So when I'm in a feature table, you know, on the TV lights, I can do that. <coughs> well, well, now are you, are you just, still, go ahead, go ahead. This is when I'm out in the, you know, normal tables in most poker rooms, it's too dark. And so the dealer's going to put a, you know, a, a five on the board and I'm going to think it's a six or something. But now, are you still affiliated with Blue Shark Optics? Yes. Well, and, I mean, and so if I want to hide my eyes now, I put on my Blue Shark Optics instead. Well, right. But now it seems like there should be a you know a lizard eye Blue Shark Optics. I mean, the, the Raymer model of the BSO should be the lizard eyes or something. They they should be able to figure out a way to brighten the cards in a dark room and still give you that sort of lizard look. I would think. Well, if there was going to we did, when I first started working with them, we looked into that very hard <laughs> and it's like my glasses were just like a little hologram sticker that you put on top of the dark sunglasses. Yeah. And the thing is too, I remember some optical type guy, an optometrist or whatever his profession was, who was telling me like, like, Oh, you don't wear those all the time. Do you? And I'm like, no, but why? And, and he's like, because those are just this flat piece of, it, I'm, it's probably not even glass, it's probably plastic. But the sticker, you know, it's on top of this flat lens. And he goes, that's actually bad for your eyesight. You know, it, that's why your glasses are curved, you know, to kind of follow the curve of your eye. If you look out through something flat like that all day long, you're actually going to damage your eyesight. So you can't put a sticker, though, on something curved. You know, it'll, right. it won't fit. It won't fit right. You're going to have little sections that are sticking up and you know, and then it's going to end up peeling off right away. And then to try to put some kind of like, you know, put the hologram actually onto the glass. Well, then that doesn't work either. And to be honest, it won't work even with a sticker because the special coating that blue shark uses so that you hide your eyes, but you still see everything. 
you put something else on top of that, now it won't do its job right. Well, it seems like a so, challenge for some some inventor out there. Somebody's got to take hold of this thing and invent well, the the lizard IBSOs. And <laughs> well, I mean, the thing it was just kind of like you know we're not sure we can do it, and if we can, it's going to take a lot of time, effort, research, and way more money than we're ever going to get back in, right. in sales. So it's like you know, even if you could do it, are you going to spend you know a million to make two hundred thousand? Seems like a good uh, good ROI on that. You know, it's probably the biggest issue is they probably couldn't find a good patent attorney, right? <laughs> no, I don't think that's the problem. Because, <laughs> I don't think and, so either. You know, the, 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 the blue share guys, it's not like they're sitting there in the lab developing this stuff. I right. Mean, it's, you know, they, they have these things made for them. Um, right. And again, I mean, it's like, even if we could develop it, it's like we would never sell enough to make up for the cost there's a chance you'd spend a whole lot of money trying and then still not be able to do it for sure and have it work well and have it look good. And so we wanted to, I mean, I definitely wanted to in a bad way, but uh, you know, it just wasn't feasible. So there is the great Bramer signature edition. And especially if you have a wider head, like I do, then, then those will be good for you. If you're someone, you know, with a more thin head, then then they're not going to fit well or look right, right on you. You're, you're welcome to buy them, right? But you might be better off with one of the other models instead, of, depending upon the shape of your head. Yeah, there's a ton of great models out there, guys. So if you're if you're out there, you're thinking, man, I need some BSOs, go check them out and check out the Raymer model. If you got a a big old head like Greg, like Greg's saying, but but Greg, let's switch gears a little bit to um uh, some of your results. And obviously, we we could spend hours going through all the results, but. Uh, a couple of things really stood out for me when I was looking through kind of your history and a ton of great success, uh, $7.8 million in career live tournament earnings, of course, $5 million from the main event in 2004. And then you got the 2012 mm-hmm. where you won four HBT titles in the same year, which is crazy. Uh, but let, let's go back to 2004. And I know you talk ad nauseum about this and people can find all kinds of information about it. But I'm kind of curious, especially right now, 15 years have passed. Uh, since since that victory where you beat David Williams heads up, so what like what sticks with you now as you think back? What are kind of those those memories that really stick with you now that 15 years have gone by from that experience? Well, I'm not I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, you know, to be honest, if it wasn't something that's like on the video, it, it gets fairly hard to remember any of those details. So I'm going to say there was lots of important hands throughout the tournament. Um, but, you know, really that it's that feeling of victory that probably sticks with the most. And they say, you know, like emotions and stuff, you know, like memories and things are tied to emotions. And so, you know, anything that can connect to that event, you know, it, it triggers that emotion, which strengthens the memory. And uh, obviously that's a fun thing to do. Do you, do you remember, like, when did it start getting, like, really, like, this is crazy? You know, at the time, you said you're a patent attorney. I mean, you played poker recreationally, I assume. But, um, you know, at what point do you remember, like, going, well, this is crazy. Like, we're down to five tables, six tables, ten tables, three tables. You know, kind of where do you remember when you're like, wow, this is actually something that could legitimately change my life in some way, either a bankroll so I can play more or, you know, obviously the, the first place prize. But do you remember when you started – thinking like that? Or were you just so in the moment that you never really got into that sort of external facing thinking? Well, I like the way you put it last there better, you know, like, so in the moment you couldn't think, which is obviously what you want to do, you know, as a poker player, or let's say you compare it to athletic performance and stuff, you know, you don't want to think about, Oh, if we win this title, you know, our team will go down in history and, I'll be able to renegotiate a better deal and blah, blah, blah. You know, you just like, let's just focus on playing the game and doing my best and the results will follow. And so that's what you want. Right. But I mean, I would say, you know, normally people, I shouldn't say normally, I said what I've heard more often, people be like, Oh, when did you first think, Hey, I could win this thing. And I would say there never really was a specific moment because I'm just very mathematical in the way I look at things in general, not just poker. And so if you'd said, when did you know you were going to win? I'd be like, never. Yeah. Until I saw like the cards, like when David turned over his hand, you know, and, and he was all in. 
then I knew I was going to win. You know, up to that moment, in my mind, it was like, oh, I have this much chip, this many of the chips, and therefore I have this percentage chance of winning. And, you know, same thing, even when I was a chip leader and halfway through, it's like, oh, well, you have a million chips, but there's 25 million in play. You know, that's 4%, but maybe I'll give myself a skill edge and have 5 to 6% chance of winning this thing. Um, so there never was a specific moment where I'm just like, oh, I'm going to win or, oh, I think I have a chance. Uh, for me, it was always like, well, if you're in, you have a chance. And that chance depends upon how many chips you have and, and how well you play. Yeah, and that, that, so that, you, that's great. I think I was just kind of curious, like, if you're, uh, yeah, I get that. I was kind of curious, like, if there was at the time, like, where you're like, okay, now, as you're kind of watching the pay jumps and that sort of thing, uh, and maybe that's because a rec, as a recreational player, it's hard to imagine not sort of thinking, okay, now, you know, I've got 100,000 locked up. Now I've got 200,000 or 500,000 or, you know, whatever that is. So it sounds like you were able to just kind of avoid all those things. And I know that's what you want to do. It just seems like it'd be hard to do. But it sounds like you were actually, because you're a logical thinker, kind of be able to separate those and just play one hand, one decision at a time. Well, I mean, I would be looking at page jumps and stuff like that. But rather than thinking like, ooh, if I can like outlast two more people, I can make another 20000 or whatever. It was more of a, ooh, here's a page jump. How important is this to everyone else? And how do I take advantage yeah. of it? Um, you know, is it, I mean, I would be the kind of guy that would, you know, look at the board and, and notice that and then say to the table, oh, look at that, guys. There's two right. more players and we uh, and we all pick up another 20,000. Yep. And I'm, I'm making sure they know because since I'm one of the bigger stacks, it's like, hey, I got you covered. Maybe you just want to fold the my raise pre-flop rather than call and see a flop. Because now if you see this flop and you hit something and it gets big and it goes bad, you could have just folded that hand and made 20,000 bucks. Yeah. So you're basically inviting people to make $20,000 folds. And oh, by the way, you'll, you'll take the pot. Exactly. And <laughs> it's not like, I mean, there's lots of decisions that are very marginal. Um, you know, it's like if I, if I, let's say, raise the button and you're in the big blind and you have king eight you can easily say well you know he's on the button his range is wide you know there's a more than a small chance that king eight is currently the best hand and here's the price i'm getting and so on and but it's not like if you just folded that it would be a bad play even if you thought like oh this is like a slightly profitable opportunity but it's also like well it's slightly profitable, but I'm out of position. And if I flop one pair, I won't be sure. And right. You know, and this guy's got position. And so it's not like it's hugely profitable. I'm um, almost no matter what, unless, unless you think I'm a real easy player to read or something like that. So that means there's still a lot of risk to it. And now that I've informed you a minute ago and you know, of the pay jump, so that's on your mind. So there's lots of those decisions that are very close, especially something like that, defending your blind. Right. So it's kind of like, you know, obviously you're going to defend with aces and kings and so on, and, and you probably should be folding the seven deuce. And, you know, so you're probably never folding the top 10 to 20%, and you're probably always folding the bottom, you know, 30 to 50%. But there's, that's a huge chunk of hands in between that just kind of, it depends. And it depends on things like who raised, how well do I think they play, how easy do I read them, do I seem to know where they're at, how tough do they make it on you, or do they just tend to like give up on the hand if they don't hit the board. So all those little factors are what makes the difference and all those in-between hands. And that's just one more little nudge to like, hey, you know, lean towards a fold. Right. Because even if you're someone who basically never bluffs, you know, I'm sure some of the audience out there is like, kind of like, yeah, I never bluff. I always, I don't bet unless I have a, think I have the best hand. You know, I bluff once or twice a day at best. Well, even that person, if we look at every time they make a bet and really look at it closely, probably half the time or more, they actually want the other person to fold. Mm-hmm. 
you know, you raise free flop with on the button with King Jack and it, and it comes King nine, seven with two hearts. They check you bet. I mean, you're not bluffing. You know, you know, you probably have the best hand, but if they don't fold now, the chance that you have the best hand right now, just went down a lot. And the chance that even when you have the best hand, you're not going to win that, that risk just went up. So it's not so much, you know, you're not bluffing at all, but you're kind of like, yeah, I just hope this person folds because I don't have that strong of a hand. And if they don't fold, then, you know, I'm either behind or significantly at risk of losing. Right. So it's just never good news when they don't fold, whether they call or raise. Um, right. and so you're not bluffing. I mean, there's no bluff to that bet at all, but you do want them to fold. And so that's the thing that uh, you would rather have an image that gets people to fold than an image that gets people to want to play back at you and pay you off. That's really good. So, so thinking about kind of all of you know, the success that you've had, and now I think you, you've done some coaching. I know you do a number of training seminars, all of those things. What would you say is really the, the key to your success? I know it's kind of a, a very vague question, a very cliche question, but you know, kind of digging in deeper, what are those things that you think that just – this is the, you know, you said earlier that you thought you had a skill edge, so you gave yourself a little bit, you know, higher percentage. What are those things that really separate you from kind of the, the general population of players uh, that, would, that would be accountable for the success that you've had? Well, I, I don't think we can just say like one little thing, so to speak. Um, yeah. It's just all of it. It's like what made Michael Jordan the greatest basketball player? You know, it wasn't like, oh, he shoots better. He dribbles better. He passes better. He did it. I mean, he did what he was doing everything. Each individual skill, however fine you want to break it down. If he wasn't the best at that skill, he was amongst the best at that skill. And that's why he was the greatest. And so, and then even someone who's not anywhere near his level, but hey, but you're still, you're good enough to be like a starter in the NBA. Then again, you are doing all those different things much, much better than all those other people that tried and didn't make it to the NBA. And so poker is the same. There's just all these different things. So are there one of the biggest things if I nailed it down would be something like emotional control. You know, I, it's not that I don't feel it when I take a beat or that I don't care or anything like that, but I don't let it, impact my decisions so i'll feel it It, oh you sucked out in a big pot it hurts but i'm over it in a few seconds certainly before the next hand can be dealt and it's not going to make me play differently the next hand and do you feel like that's something go ahead i'm sorry the only reason i'm going to play different is that if i think it changes your perception of so if you think that I'm on tilt, and I'll sometimes act like I'm on tilt, but then the point of that is that now if I happen to be dealt a strong hand, the next hand or the one after, I can play it really fast and maybe get a lot more action if you think I'm on tilt. Hmm. And do you feel like that uh, that emotional control is something you just always had? It's sort of innate. It's your personality, or is that something that you have worked on uh, as part of your game? I've worked on it, but it's also a little bit of a, of an innate thing. I'm just, you know, probably even slightly autistic, you know, just, I think about things differently than other people. The stuff that gets me upset or doesn't get me upset isn't necessarily the same as most people. Um, you know, my brain definitely works in different ways than, than the average person in terms of how I think about things. So it's just a combination of all that stuff. Um, you know, and I am always looking. I seem to also be a lot more attentive than most people. I, I notice the little details of what's going on around me. A lot of people seem very oblivious. I'm always amazed at how oblivious people are. And it's not just because they're hunched over their phone or something. But even when they're not, even when it seems like, oh, they're looking around and have a clue, they're not. You know, how often do people bump into you, you know, at the airport or whatever, you know, out in public, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just like, it's not like I'm some little guy and, you know, oh, oh you're <laughs> so small, I missed you. Um, I mean, I literally had people 
you know, who will just walk right into me and they're not looking at their phone, but they're like looking up or to the side or whatever. Right. And I'm just standing there and I've been standing there since they were 50 <laughs> yards away. I haven't moved, you know, in the last minute. And here's this person who just walks right into me. And I'm just thinking like, what is your problem? But they're just that oblivious to what's going on. And, and, and you see I'm that always the guy at the table who notices all the little details, you know, with the dealers making change, he's supposed to give you 700, he gives you 800. And I'm like, Hey, you gave him too much change. You know, you didn't give him enough change. He gave you 600 instead of 700. And so I'm constantly, I mean, if, if any of those little things are being pointed out by a player at my table, at least nine out of 10 times I'm the player who's pointing it out. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Attention to detail is huge. Uh, I want to give, make sure I live, leave room for John, Rob, do you guys have anything right now? Otherwise I'll keep firing away. John. I have a uh, one question. So you are, you, when you came and gained your popularity in poker, it was kind of at the, the, when poker was at its all time high. And so your name you know, is in the name of, of, you know, Phil Helmuth, Chris Moneymaker, the names that everyone knows. When I told my wife I was going to be on the phone with Greg Raymer, she said, the Greg Raymer. Whereas we've interviewed some other people. I like that. Yeah. (laughs) I like that. Uh, We've interviewed some other people who are very well known in the poker realm these days. Sure. But haven't crossed that divide to being known by the average person. So how does that impact your life? Well, I'll tell you one thing. There is no reason you want to be famous unless you can monetize it. (laughs) And it's not that I'm dislike it when people come up to me in public and they want a picture, an autograph, or they just want to shake my hand and say, hi, you know, 99 plus percent of those interactions are friendly, positive, and so I'm, I'm perfectly happy about it. But there's really no great benefit unless, unless your ego needs stroking. There's no benefit to being famous if you can't use it to make money. Um, basically, it's not that I did something all that special winning in 04 versus people who won other years. That was just the peak audience for ESPN. I mean, when they did it for the first time in, in, the, in the big way with the whole card cameras in 03, it was a tremendous success. They were broadcast. The ratings they got were through the roof compared to what they expected. Um, they were rerunning it more than they ever thought they would. The next year, they ramped up coverage even more, and they started covering a bunch of preliminary events. And I'm pretty sure that my win was rerun on ESPN more than any year before or since and got higher ratings. And that's just you know the coincidence of that year. So if you wanted fame, publicity, whatever, that was the best year to win the main event. If you wanted money, it was two years later when Jamie Gold won $12 million. And, and not that it's a problem any year that you might have won the main event. Obviously, it's, you're happy with that money no matter what. Uh, but without a doubt, I mean, if you sent me and everyone who's won the main event sent me to Disney World and had us spread out and, you know, just monitor how often we were recognized, I'm sure I would, you know, I might get recognized more than all the rest of them put together. And it's not because they're not great poker players or anything else. None of this is a negative comment on them. It's just that the ratings on ESPN and especially the number of times it gets rerun is dramatically down from the peak year in 04. How, how do you feel about that? Then, like, uh, so walking the hallways of the Rio during the World Series, I mean, I, I'm constantly seeing people that I recognize, and you know, you tend to give them their space. Uh, but there are certain people that are like, oh man, it'd be kind of fun to meet them, even though I know they're probably annoyed by this. Um, what about for you? I mean, do you, how do you see that when you're walking? Because clearly, if you're walking the hallways, people are going to recognize you. People are going to want pictures. If you're playing at the table, people are going to want selfies. Does that bother you as somebody who's sort of you just kind of self labeled yourself as? maybe slightly autistic or, uh, or do you kind of welcome that? Or if you're not mo- able to monetize it, how do you personally deal with the, the fame at least during the world series? No, it doesn't bother me at all. You know, unless I'm obviously in the middle of something, 
Um, and particularly like if I have a live hand in front of me at the poker table. So, so literally like if you were standing on the rail and I looked at my cards, folded my hand, and then you were like, excuse me, Greg, like, could you sign my hat? I would be perfectly happy with that. Hmm. Wouldn't bother me in the slightest. Or if you were like, Hey, can I get the picture here? You know, like, can you turn around? I'm going to do a selfie. Um, no problem. Now, if you try to ask me that stuff while I'm sitting there with cards in front of me, then I'm not very pleased. Um, and I've had that happen more than once where someone's been standing there on the rail for a significant period of time, even an hour or more. And now I'm in the middle of like the biggest hand I've played all day long, biggest pot of the day. And they're like tapping me on the shoulder, asking me to no. sign something. And I'm, and I know what's happened. It's like the guy was standing there. He got like a message from his wife or whatever, you know, someone saying, Hey, come on. Like, you got to get ready. we got to go to the show soon. Something like that. And he realized, oh, shoot, I have to go. And I kept meaning to ask this. So now they're going to ask right now as soon as that thought crossed their mind. And they're just not aware enough to realize, like, oh, wait, you know, that's not appropriate. He's playing a hand. Unfortunately, and fortunately, not unfortunately, fortunately, I'm ignoring them because I'm in this pot. I'm trying, you know, I don't want to give off tells and stuff usually one of the people next to me at the table will like turn around like, Hey dude, like, like leave him alone. He's right. this, this is a big pot. I don't think he wants to sign your hat right now. So they will, you know, step up to the plate for me, so to speak. You know, my concern there is just no matter how I interact with this person, the opponent I'm playing in this pot, it might make them think I'm, you know, weak, strong, whatever. And so unless I feel confident that, if I react to this fan in a certain way, it's going to make you think this, and that's what I want you to think. Then I don't want to do anything at all. You know, I don't try to manipulate my opponent unless I'm reasonably confident it's going to work. Yeah. And for most people, you just can't, you know, like in other words, if you were allowed to say whatever you wanted about your hand and you, you know, bet on the river and the guy's thinking, you know, you say to him, yeah, you can fold. I've got it. Well, for some people, they'd be more likely to call. For some, they'd be more likely to fold. And so it's hard to know which kind of person that is. And then anything else overt that you might do, they might take as a, oh, wait, he must be strong. He's so casual. He turned around casually, started chatting with the fan. You know, if he was bluffing, he'd be too nervous to do that. So I think he has a hand. But someone else might take the exact opposite. And kind of like, oh, he's acting casual like that because he wants me to think that he's comfortable and not bluffing. <laughs> right. And therefore, you know, so you don't know how they're going to take it. And so unless, unless I've played with you and know you well enough to think I know how you're going to take it, I'll just do nothing instead. So as you think about the the training, I know you do a lot of different training sessions. You've actually done at least once or twice in Minnesota. You've come back and done Canterbury Park. <laughs> there but with yeah. all the tr all the training you do and you know yeah, our target tar yeah yeah right uh even though they're a competitor to our official sponsor running aces we still love all of our minnesota casinos um but but as you think about all the training you've done and especially with recreational players what are those i guess what are those key concepts that you think generally we struggle with the most as recreational players or that seem to be people just aren't really getting it or they need extra added attention or you know can, can you put your finger on some of those things that really seem to be the toughest pieces of the game, whether it's personality approach or whether it's, you know, a specific strategy that, uh, you know, we just have struggle with in general. I, it's a hard question to answer and any answer yeah. is going to be less than perfect. Right. I would say the best I can do is to say, think about fear. There are a lot of poker players who play out of fear. And, and again, that's like one of my advantages. I don't really feel that. I don't sit there and I'm not afraid of going bust or anything else. You know, one of the, you know, best opponents to have is a calling station. Mm -hmm. And a lot of calling stations, the reason they're calling stations is fear. They are afraid to fold the winner. So they don't want to fold, but they're afraid they're going to lose more. So they don't want to raise. And so they feel like, well, I'll just kind of take this safe middle approach. 
And in many aspects of life, kind of the middle ground is kind of the safer, more conservative approach to things. But in poker, it's basically the worst possible thing to do. I mean, if you took every hand you've ever evaluated and said, okay, here's this decision on this street, um, and the player can fold, call, or raise, and we're going to submit this to a panel of 100 of the best poker players we can find and have each of them vote, just fold, call, raise. That's it. No other analysis. Just pick a decision. Mm -hmm. You should find that much, much less than one third of them have voted for call when you give them this whole wide range of, of situations. You know, you give me a hundred of these questions with a hundred very different situations and you give it to a hundred other people. I would hope that call was the least common of the three choices. And yet, obviously the calling station and a lot of other players, you know, in practice, if you sat there and just watch players and just put a little check next to every time they did a fold, a call or a raise, you would probably find that they were calling, you know, more than half the time. Hmm. And so that's, I think most of that is driven from fear. And the same thing, people are afraid of going broke. They're afraid of looking foolish. They're, uh, you know, they're afraid of all these things that, you know, of losing more money. But I'm afraid to fold because what if I had the best hand or what if I was going to make the best hand? I mean, you know, you and Rob play a pot against each other. I folded pre-flop. And then when the hand is over, I make a comment like, oh, should have played my deuce seven because there were, you know, two sevens on the board. Yeah. It's not like I'm actually regretting my fold. But I've seen players who like are visibly upset. Right. When they fold, even a hand that was clearly correct to fold. Now, maybe they're not upset with seven deuce. But if they had seven, nine off suit, now they're like, well, that's a hand that might be playable. And, you know, now they're really mad that they folded it. You know, it's like, but wait, like the guy in early position raised, you know, right. and if you called the raise, it's 10% of your stack. And that's really too much to risk with such a marginal hand. You know, you can't just be calling off 10% of your stack to, to try to hit a flop. It clearly is a fold. And if it's not a fold, then it has something to do with, you know, dynamics beyond the ordinary going on at the table. And yet this person is just like losing their shit because they want to flop trips and double up. Yep. Um, you know, so all of that stuff, you know, don't worry about, you know, you can't be second guessing. If you made a mistake, well, figure it out why and don't make it again. So but it's part of that fear too? Fear, is that, is yeah, that, it's all that fear. That's, that's like fear that now, you know, you just got to go. I mean, like if you were playing Monopoly, you know, we were all playing Monopoly. We put up a hundred bucks each and we're playing Monopoly winner take all. Like when I hit a good roll, are you going to like lose your temper <laughs> right. you know, and bitch and moan about how I bad beat you? Like, Jesus, the only safe role for you is a nine and you got it. You're such a, you know, I mean, you know, I doubt people are going to go crazy like they sometimes do at the poker table or go on tilt. And you're certainly not going to say like, you know, like, oh, I landed on this property, but I'm not going to buy it because I'm afraid that it's going to take too much to my remaining bankroll. You're just going to say, which, you know, which is the smartest play here? And whether you're right or wrong, you're going to make the decision that you think gives you the best chance of winning the game. But you're, there's not going to be any fear involved that like, oh, God, like, should I, you know, like, I'm probably supposed to buy this, but, you know, like, what if I now, like, land on this other better property, you know, and don't have enough money to buy it. Um, you know, those kinds of things aren't probably what you're thinking when you play a game like that. So it's fear doesn't seem to enter into the equation with these other games, even if you were playing them for money. But in poker, for some reason, people are just like, you know, how many times have you heard someone say like, oh, like, I know I have you beat, but I'm going to fold anyways. Well, right. if, if that's true, then it must be that like, well, I'm confident I have the best hand, but I'm too afraid to take a chance. 
Right. Yeah. It's funny you use the, uh, the dice analogy. I've used that same analogy myself and, you know, where you can start yelling at the dice or, you know, see people yelling at the dealer in poker, the same kind of thing, these, these random events. And uh, yeah, all of those things you talk about, we see all the time, the guy that, you know, under the gun raises the next guy shoves all in for 60 big blinds and the guy folds pocket fours and is super upset when a, a four comes like, seriously, like what is happening? Yeah. So let me, yeah, let me, you guys, you got to avoid that stuff if you want to like, not go crazy, <laughs> let, alone sure. become a, right. when it, let alone becoming a, you know, a, a top quality player. That's good. So we're, we're almost at time. I mean, the time just flies by when we do these interviews, Greg. Um, Rob, did you have something you wanted to ask? Well, in this vein that we were just talking about, it's, it's kind of where people are now results oriented as opposed to being process oriented. So the result was, well, I would have flopped fours, but the process says I can't call there. And so you have to maintain that process oriented. And I'm thinking Greg probably does that because he mentioned he's kind of a math-based player. And so, yeah, fear is what causes some people to be results oriented. But I, I look at more results versus process. Yeah, and you need to ignore the results. I mean, people often had asked me, like, hey, you used to be a lawyer. And, and I know there's some other good players that, that are or used to be lawyers. What is it about being a lawyer that makes you a good poker player? And my answer to that question is basically, mm, I can't think of anything that, you know, why it is I was better at poker because of my legal training. But being a poker player definitely made me a better lawyer, you know, or a better scientist or a better anything because it teaches you to ignore the results and focus on the process. Because if you make smart decisions, you know you're gonna win in the long run. And the luck factor is so huge, you have to learn to ignore the short-term results. And when it comes to tournament poker, unless you're playing online, you know, where you can play you know, a dozen or two dozen tournaments a day, there are no long-term results, essentially. I mean, I have friends that play online poker for a living that play tournaments. And they will play as many tournaments in a week as I can in a year. And here's someone who's made a living at it for many years. And then they have a losing month. And then the next month they're back, you know, getting the same kind of results maybe they used to get. And so it was obviously just luck. You know, they had an unlucky month and later on they might have a lucky month. But their unlucky month is equivalent to me having an unlucky four years. Right. So by the time you get into the long run for tournaments, it, it doesn't, you know, like so much time has passed. The poker world's not the same. You're not the same. Everything's different, which means now the, the numbers can't be combined, so to speak. Um, you know, the results from 10 years ago and today, you know, aren't meaningfully combined because the poker world was, it was so much easier to win back 10 years and 20 years ago. So mixing those results in also doesn't give you a great result. And if it's all live tournaments, it still isn't statistically that significant. Right. So yeah. It's hard to ignore that, but you still just have to focus on decisions. So, you know, anytime you think like, ah, oh, man, I should have called or whatever, you know, Take some notes at the table, whether on your phone or bring a notepad with you, and then go over it later. Like, you know, find a, a training resource, find your best poker friends and discuss with them. And, and like, don't tell them what would have happened. Just say, hey, here was this spot. What do you think? Should I have called or folded or raised or what? And if the conclusion is the fold was correct, then that should be the end of it. Like you, you got it right. Everything else is meaningless. And if you conclude otherwise, now you've learned something and maybe you're a better player. For sure. Yeah. That's i I'm an actuary by trade, Greg. So the whole statistical significance thing is something I try to explain to people yeah. too. And it's just, people just don't, it's very hard for people to like grasp that, that concept, especially, you know, recreational players and how many tournaments we play a year. Uh, it's just, it's just very hard to draw real strong conclusions from, from a lot of that. So, exactly. so as, as we're kind of nearing the end here, I guess uh, any, any advice that you'd have to recreational players? So just to give you a little bit of a, 
of a context. You know, we do have some some top level players that are listening to the show, but a lot of our folks are either you know they're playing home games, barley games, or small buy in tournaments at casinos, all the way up to you know maybe the thousand fifteen hundred dollar buy ins, uh, some regional things like the MSBTs or whatever. That's kind of our target audience that that's listening to this. And normally we talk a lot of strategy. Sure. We we haven't talked a lot of strategy in this one. Uh, just because it's kind of a fun getting to know you and a little bit of your background and how you think. But um, for the fo- for the folks that are listening, kind of what what advice or encouragement or uh, what would you have to say kind of to the masses as far as uh, the tips that you might have to improve our game? Sure. Well, until I won the main event, I was still a full-time attorney. And so, you know, I was in that same category as, you know, what you're describing to me as your typical audience member. And I had a separate poker bankroll. So here was this money that had been set aside originally a thousand dollars for poker. And that was the money I would play poker with. And so I would treat that the way a pro would treat their bankroll if, if they were, you know, trying to play poker for a living. So you have to say like, what tournaments can I afford out of this bankroll? Now, when you have a regular job and poker is, is mostly a hobby and it's just something you want to get better at, you don't have to be as formal as having a specific poker bankroll. But you still want to have a budget of some sort, like, hey, I'm only going to let myself lose this much money in a week or a month or a year. You know, they can pick the time period of their choosing. And that way, if you stick to that, you're never going to hurt yourself. You're never going to run into any problems or issues. And then just do the best you can within that. And of course, if you're not having fun, find another hobby. Right. Um, you know, this is tough enough when you're trying to do it as a, as a livelihood. But if you're trying to do it for fun, you know, you admit like, hey, this isn't going to be a significant source of extra income that I'm not doing it. Because to be honest, if you're good enough, you know, mentally to beat poker for anything other than tiny amounts of money, then you're, you're smart enough and competent enough that you can probably do other things to make extra money and make just as much or more. So the reason to, to pick poker is because you love it. It's fun. You enjoy it. If you're finding that you're not enjoying it, then you've got to really seriously rethink it and say, like, why am I doing this? Especially if you're not winning money that you need to have to help pay bills or something. Um, but then play with them in that bankroll and try to, like, slowly build it and work your way up. So I started off with a $1,000 bankroll. Of course, this is before the poker boom when cash games were limit. And I would play 3-6 limit hold them didn't matter that I had a good job as an attorney and was making decent money. I wasn't playing bigger than that until I built up the bankroll enough to justify playing bigger. And I could take an occasional shot at a bigger game maybe, but you know, I couldn't just take a thousand dollars and say, Hey, let's play 10, 20 limit every night when I go play. Cause even if I was a good player in that game, there was an excellent chance that I could, you know, lose the whole thousand just because of a little bit of downturn of bad luck. So stick within the bankroll or stick within a budget and then do the, all the things you can afford to do to improve your game. Um, if you want to play tournaments, I have to recommend my book. It's, it's out now. Um, the booth for D and publishing, the, the, the publisher of it is going to be here at the Rio all summer. So you can go buy my book and any of the dozens of other books that they publish and sell. You can buy it on the you know various online venues that sell books. You can hopefully find it in your bookstore soon enough. It, it probably I doubt it'd be on the shelves this week, but it might be on the shelves you know within a few weeks. I don't know if we're going to get it on the shelves of every bookstore or not. Um, I I hope that this book I've put a lot of time and effort into it. I hope that this is going to be considered the book for tournament poker, and uh, we will see. Now that it's out, you know, in the world and people are going to be able to start buying it and reading it, we'll see what the feedback is. But that was my goal to make like the one book that covered all the basics and then some and laid it all out in a very clearly worded, logical way so that you can 
read through it carefully and really know exactly what I'm trying to say to you. Um, you know, there's always some books out there that the author knows what they're talking about, but they don't say it very well. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to interpret like, wait, 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 he said, do this sometimes. What does sometimes mean? Um, <laughs> right. You know, I tried to avoid that kind of stuff as much as I could. Um, to some extent, you're limited by the English language and all that because you, you can't necessarily put exact numbers on everything. But I hope that it's worded extremely well and that you will really know what it is I'm trying to say that I'm suggesting for different things. Um, but beyond my book, there's lots of other good books. There are online poker forums. You know, there's podcasts like this. There's lots of things that are free or cheap that can really help improve your game. One of the best things is just to put together your own group of players whom you respect and you talk over hands with this, with these people, you know, and go back and forth and debate and stuff like that. And so you feel confident that you have figured out what's the best thing that, that I can do in a situation like that when it comes up again next time. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's one of the things that we're big proponents of, you know, here is, is find your poker community, find your, your tribe, if you will, and kind of learn the game together. And that's, that's what we've been doing yep. a lot of. We typically do these recordings and then uh, if we're not in- interviewing somebody that week, it's just us talking hands and going through hands. And uh, we just, we just love that. I totally agree. So, so your book is, is it called Fossil Man's Winning Poker Strategies? Uh, almost winning tournament strategies. Fossil oh, winning. Man's Winning Tournament Strategies. Better yet. If this is a tournament focused book. Um, you know, and I hope this will just be the get- beginning of a series of books. Um, uh, the publisher is like, oh, we'd like a PLO book. Maybe you can do one of those next. Um, and I've started writing that. I'm, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a much better tournament player than I am PLO player. So I'm, as I'm writing the PLO book, I'm kind of like, eh, you know, I think this is right what I'm saying. I'm not sure. I mean, I've, I'm going to be working with a co-author on that. But, uh, you know, I might decide to actually just, put that one aside and do some more tournament stuff and have like, you know, you mentioned discussing hands, like put out a book where it's just, Hey, here's a whole series of hand situations. And here's how I recommend thinking through each decision in this hand, you know, with maybe reference back to my tournament book as to like, okay, see here, you know, we're in a situation where you raised pre flop and two people called and, you know, let's talk about whether you're going to bet or not and bet sizing and stuff. And, you know, cause every now and then you run into things where it's like, Oh wait, you know, when I think about the chapter on slow playing and I think about the chapter on C betting and like, how do I bring those two together? Because maybe I flopped really big. And so is it more the slow playing advice that I should apply or is it the C betting advice that I should apply? And so this book will, you know, and it'll get written at some point, whether it's the next book or the third or the fourth, but where it will do that, like just let's run through several dozen hands and yeah, I, th- I think that's any- why, you know, we're applying you- one concept over another. Sorry, we got a little bit of a delay there. I apologize. I don't mean to be talking over you there. Um, yeah, I think no anything for, from my perspective, both my learning style and I think a lot of people that I've talked to on the show and the feedback we get is, you know, anything you can do to kind of merge the, the, the actual application to the specific hands as well as the concepts. So for me, like if you're, yep. if you're only running through the hands, I hear, oh, it depends. And you get little bits and pieces of concepts. But for me, it, my personality is I want to know the overriding concept, the underlying sort of framework yes. to which I should need to build upon. But if you only you get the underlying, if you, yeah, I know, I know, I'm so excited. If you only get the underlying concept in the framework without any application, then it can be hard sometimes too to find those examples. So I think that's, I like that idea of, okay, here's the concept, here's how you think about the game, and then here's some actual application and kind of being able to go back and forth. And I think that helps solidify the concepts that you're, that you're driving at. Yeah, and my book is not like sitting here with charts and stuff. It's not like, here are the, you know, hands that you raise with an early position and here's hands in middle position and blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't have those kind of like starting hand charts or any of that kind of stuff because while that information can take someone who's a raw beginner and turn them into someone who's not bad, there's no way you can 
learn the game that way and become a great player. You have to go way past that stuff to become a great player because it's always situational. There are always reasons that you should be either much tighter or much looser than that chart says you normally would be from that position. Um, there's just all the silly little things like, oh, wait, there's 20 minutes left in day one of the main event. Right. And I'm the big stack at the table. And I might be able to just raise all 10 of the hands that we have left tonight. And unless someone has a top five hand, they're just going to fold. And, and like, they just want to get in the bag and come back, you know, the next day. They just don't want to take a risk of going broke anymore. So you might look around the table, recognize that situation, and then just say, yeah, of course you would normally fold jack seven in early position. But here I think if I raise, even though I'm in early position, I think there's a 70% chance that everyone's going to fold. So raise with it anyway. And if they don't fold, they might just call and they're going to then fold if they don't hit the flop. Right. And if that's the case, if that's the situation, you're just leaving money on the table if you don't do it. Um, and other times you might just say like, oh, wow, that guy's on tilt and he's down to 12 big blinds. And if I raise, he's going to shove even if his hand sucks. But <laughs> I was thinking of raising here with the, you know, five, four suited. And I don't want to get 12 big blinds in with five high right. against the guy on tilt because randomly he's going to have a better hand than that for an all-in preflop. So now you're saying like, oh, normally this is a hand I would raise, but I won't because of this unique situation. Um, so you, I try to teach concepts. Here are the things you should be thinking about and the ideas you need to understand. Now you, it's your job to figure out how to apply them properly. I love yeah, it. And I try to explain how to apply them, but there's obviously always going to be a big learning curve to that. So in that sense, you know, if you just want charts, my book isn't for you. But if you want to learn how to become a great player and understand these concepts and that these are kind of your building block tools, you know, so it'd be like, you know, what is like a football coach do, you know, in, in spring training or whatever. I mean, let's, you know, and not professionals, but you know, when you're like in high school and stuff, it's like, let's have, blocking drills and tackling drills like we are trying to get you to improve at those fundamental things that are part of the game and once you can do that stuff well enough then we start like running plays and you know this is when you're going to use your blocking and your tackling and your throwing and blah 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 and the skills that we've been working on but we got to work on those basic skills first and to me that's like the concepts of poker so you learn the concepts well. Now when you're in the real hand, you can figure out which ones to apply, how to apply them, and make the best decision. Love it, man. That's, that sounds really good. And I know we're, we're over time, Greg, and I do want to respect your time. And I know you got a lot of poker in your near future. So uh, let, me, let me, John, Rob, did you guys have anything else you wanted to share or ask at all? Looks like we're – oh, John? No, I just wanted to say it's uh, been a pleasure, and at least I'll be able to brag to my wife tonight. <laughs> well, hopefully that'll <laughs> – no comment. <laughs> I was going to say something yeah, I should have so said. I didn't mean that, that in any way that it sad, sounds. But like, <laughs> yeah, you know, I didn't mean it like, like that. I don't, I, 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 so it's, not, it's not like I'm an A-list. It's not like it's like, oh, like, honey, I just had a one-hour chat with Matt Damon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would that, that sounds more worthy of bragging than, than than I would say to have a chat with me. But I appreciate that you put it that way. Well, I just want to thank you, Greg, for uh, chatting with us today. It was really a pleasure talking to you. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. And uh, you know, feel free to reach back out to me again later. We can we can do another one, and maybe we can jump right to some hand analysis, and oh, you know, within the first ten fifteen minutes, uh, you yeah. Know, and, yeah, well, yeah, we'll for sure do that, Greg, because that, that's actually what we normally like to do. The first time people come on, it you know, we like to get into the hands, but sometimes it's more of this background, and it's kind of fun to chat with you. And I know you're uh, you're sort of a, a reluctant uh, man of fame, but you know, it's, it's fun to you know talk to a World Series of Poker main event bracelet winner is super fun and that sort of thing. But yeah, we'd love to talk strategy. We'd love to check out your book. Uh, we're constantly looking for different things that fit well with our rec player uh, audience. Uh, 
And so your book might be one of those that we choose to do kind of a book study on. So we'll, we'll take a look at that too. And uh, I'll definitely be in touch and see if there's a way that we can partner going forward, including having you on and just rolling up our sleeves and digging into hands. That would be fantastic. Uh, but for people that yeah, want to connect, people and, that want to connect with don't you. Don't worry about me. I, I, I said uh, autistic, but that's more of a, like, I tend not to react emotionally to things as right. opposed to like, I'm introverted or shy or don't like to talk to people or any of that. I mean, I used to be a DJ, stand up comic. You know, so, I mean, I get out and mix with the world, but I, you know, don't get emotional about stuff. Yeah. Um, at least a lot of things. I don't get emotional about a lot of things that most people would. And uh, I'm sure my wife would say that I get emotional about some things that she feels I shouldn't. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's not like I'm just absolutely yeah. like zero affect all the time or anything. But that's more what I meant is that Yeah. I just seem to naturally not get overly emotional. I mean, when we're getting like, Oh, some company's kind of screwing us over and we need to call customer service. My wife will ask me to call because she's like, I'm going to start yelling at this person. You right. Know, like, you know, like they've screwed us over and, you know, and I'm like, well, I'm talking to so-and-so and he or she is not the person who right. screwed us. They didn't do anything. So I'm not mad at them. Yeah. I'm not mad at them because it's kind of like, well, they just answered the 800 number. They didn't cause the problem. It was the local store or whatever, you know, so I'm not going to yell at them unless they start like treating me like crap. Right. Um, but if, if they're being professional with me, then then I'm not emotional with them. And it's kind of like, well, you know, I know this isn't your fault, but boy, I mean, you kind of got to agree, don't you, that, you know, like this other party of the company, you know, kind of like messed things up and I deserve you guys to, fix the problem um right you know and like if you don't have the authority can i talk to your supervisor please because maybe they can do something and, you know and i've had lots of them like oh well thank you for being so nice usually people are screaming at me <laughs> right during right on the call and i'm like you know well hey julie or bob you know whatever the name is like it wasn't your fault so i I'm, you know thanks for your help and right no and, that's and so good. I'm, I'm that way i'm you know I get mad at things that are, I expect to work. You know, like when my computer gives me a problem, I'm like, you're a damn machine. You're not a complicated <laughs> human that does things for stupid reasons. You're supposed to work. So then I get mad at the thing, you know, the machine and stuff. You're not supposed to mess up. You're just a damn machine. You're not that complicated. Um, so that kind of stuff. And my wife's like, why are you mad at the, you know, the toaster? And I'm like, because it like didn't work. <laughs> it's like it, it should work you know and like had, I, basically i expect i expect people to do stupid things and not right. work right and and the toaster has no feelings so you're not going to hurt his feelings by yelling at it either so worst well, case scenario is i like you know break it and have to buy a new one like, right. and then that's i've only hurt myself i haven't hurt anyone else <laughs> right you right. know, so I, that's the worst case scenario is you're like, you know, like, damn it, I'm just going to smash this thing because it's pissing me off. <laughs> Sorry, honey, but no toast today, but I'll go buy a new toaster. Right. You can have toast tomorrow. At all. Um, but, <laughs> you know, so that's all I meant. So certainly fans yeah. shouldn't think like, oh, don't talk to this guy. He doesn't like talking to people. But just, you know, as long as I'm not like running through the airport trying to make a connection or I don't have a live hand in front of me on the poker table, you know, feel free. And if I'm just too busy to stop for a moment, I'll just apologize and say, I'm sorry, I don't have time. Um, you know, but hey, you know, I'm signing my book at the, uh, you know, the, the publisher's booth here up the hall tomorrow and you'll be able to find me then and i'll have definitely have time for a picture or whatever awesome but like oh now we're on break and i'm about to have my hand killed and i'll get back there in a minute you know, right. so i'm just always telling them you know i'm happy to tell them if i don't have time but you know if i have time then great i'll stop and, and give them a minute and answer a question or take a picture whatever they like well, and that's, you know, that we'll kind of, kind of leave it with that. I mean, that's something that I think everybody appreciates about you is that you are so gracious. Uh, you're a very good ambassador for poker, for the World Series Thank of you. Poker. You know, there's been champions that I run into that are not that way. And I think that's just something about you that I think uh, all the poker community should be proud of uh, to have you representing. And as John said, sort of transcending poker in a sense because of the timing of everything that you became a household name beyond poker. And I think it's great that it happened to be somebody like yourself who's actually willing to 
uh, be approachable and, and have people uh, be accessible to people. So thanks for that. So if you, guys want, if you guys want to connect with Greg, uh, you follow him on Twitter, uh, Fossil Man, at Fossil Man, uh, FossilManPoker.com. And watch out for the new book that's out there, Fossil Man's Winning Tournament Strategies. So, Greg, uh, man, thank you so much. This really was an honor and a pleasure, and uh, you're very easy to chat with, and I appreciate that. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. You know, I mean, like, you know, I like people from everywhere, but, you know, Minnesotans, you know, famously oh. nice and friendly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, got to gotta love that. And you guys don't, don't uh, change that image at all. So it's been a pleasure and I uh, hope I get to see you soon. And, and, you know, if running aces is your sponsor, tell them like, I'll be happy to come to a seminar at running aces. So you can just go tell them like, Hey, you should bring Greg in. Yeah. We've been and, in conversation. Uh, so we, we definitely him. will. And I'll be happy to come back to Minnesota and do it there. Even if they bring me back when it's cold, that's, I can live with that. <laughs> as long as we keep you indoors, we'll be just fine. Well, hopefully uh, by yeah. the time this, by the time this airs, you'll have one or two bracelets this summer as well. So uh, that'll be fun to promote it that way. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm planning on winning like 15 because like that's the most I could possibly manage right. if I just won every event I entered. That would be and a good obviously year. that's not, that's not realistic, but like, that's the plan, you know, like, win the big 50 and then whatever it is I enter after that, you know, win that one. And you always just plan on, you know, you're like, why would you enter a tournament if you're not right. planning on winning it? So I will just plan on that. And then obviously I'll almost certainly settle, you know, billion to one, I'll settle for something less than that. <laughs> and, uh, but all you can do is make the best decision. That's why that kind of goal doesn't mean, you know, it's, a, it's a silly goal to say like, Oh, I'm, my goal is to win a bracelet or my goal is to make the final table. You know, the only goal that makes sense to me is I'm going to try my best to make sure that I make the best possible decision every time it's my turn. Awesome. Well, on that note, well, we'll let you go, Greg. We're going to continue the conversation, so feel free Cheers. to Thank you. Just hang up. But thanks again. Take care. You got it. Nice chat with you guys. Have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Well, that was fun. Hey, yeah, hey Jack. Yeah. Jack, did you want to get uh, promoted so you can chat, or are you just going to listen in? Shoot me a chat if you want me to promote you. Uh, go ahead, Rob. Hey, is this going to be on YouTube? Yes. Well, then you should probably uh, blank out his telephone number. Yeah, I saw that too. So I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i edit that out. I'll either put a picture of him just the entire time, and maybe yeah. not at all, uh, but I can, I can crop out that part of the screen for sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking at that going, this might be kind of sketchy. <laughs> yeah, I know. We'll go crazy. <laughs> Everybody a lot of phone calls he doesn't want. <laughs> I'll, I'll put his email address out there too. We'll just put this whole thing and deluge him with questions. <laughs> so anything, uh, anything the stick out there? The bad thing is it, it was just really hard to drag an answer out of him. Yeah. You know, I thought, those one word answers were tough. Especially yeah, at the I beginning, wish... right? Yeah. I know. I'm like, oh man, I don't have enough questions. <laughs> <laughs> But once he kind of got rolling on something he wanted to chat about, it was pretty pretty easy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything interesting there out of, out of that at all? Anything surprising or? What no, I, I think you know he talked uh, early on about his uh, math approach, and then the fact that he's very even keel. Yeah. So, you know, these are qualities I think that we've been talking about a lot lately, especially uh, with the things that we've been doing with the Fox and, and the other, other conversations we've had, that it's more about the process. It's more about, you know, we learned a lot about the math and we learned a lot about maintaining, you know, not getting tilted. We had Jared T Tandler on yep. those types of things. So it sounds like he, he really is that person that it does all those things. So, and you can see that he's had success. So, it kind of goes hand in hand. It's it's a testament that that's really what we need to look at. I agree. Yeah, it seems like a very natural, very natural thing for him. Very good. Well, if we don't have anything else, we can kind of cut it off there. Unless you guys have anything you want to chat about. Somsky, you don't want to talk about your your deep deep run in the double stack. No, fourth place doesn't qualify as a deep uh, run. It qualifies dang. as a cash. Well, all right, 80, 80 people, you made it to the, to the fourth, and you had uh, you were one uh, one flip away from being a chip leader with three to go, right? I mean, 
I know. I'm, I'm still a wreck guy. I mean, that's a deep run to me. It's a nice result. And, you know, those double stacks are generally pretty tough tournaments, I think, as far as weekly. Yeah, but go. like every other day, you have yourself in a winner's <laughs> running. Games, so. I, haven't play, I haven't been playing hardly at all, dude. I've been MIA, man. I got to get back well, in there. It's even more impressive that you get your photo <laughs> up there all that often. Then that's not, but that's not the double stack tourney, man. You know, see, I got, I got to know what what the uh, oceans to swim in. You go swim yeah, in the sharks. He's, he's playing the thirty dollar and the sixty dollar. You know, he he's not playing that hundred fifty dollar big stuff. I rarely play the thirty anymore at all. It's been a long time <laughs> since I played the thirty. I will if I if I can, but it's the the seventy fives are kind of what I like. The seventy five to hundreds and. Okay. Those things, yeah, I know yeah. it's it's a balancing act. <laughs> well, John, you had a deep run, and uh, you don't you don't play as often as Steve, even though he's claiming he doesn't play that often anymore. <laughs> uh, you still don't play as often as he does, I'm sure. So, no. congratulations on a final table. I made a final table of one of those like four years ago, but I've only played two or three of them, so I don't play the hundred fifties either. You know, so. That's a pretty good percentage, though. I think that's uh, that is definitely something that Greg Raymer would say is statistically significant. That you <laughs> you finally you final table fifty percent of the double stacks. Yeah, one out of two. That's how, met, that's how I met Brian Maury for the first time. Oh, is that right? Yeah, he was with me. <laughs> okay. Oh, funny. All right. Well, thanks guys for jumping on here. That's kind of fun to chat with Greg. And you know, man, World Series of Poker main event bracelet winner seems like a pretty pretty sweet, good dude. Very accessible guy. Uh, he's even he's even inviting people. Hey, if you see me, you know, make sure it's an opportune time. But I'll sign something for you. That's pretty. That's pretty. You know, he doesn't have to do that. I think that's a pretty uh, nice statement uh, that he's making there. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, I agree. All right, gentlemen, we'll have a good night, and we'll chat with you soon. All right, see you, Steve. <laughs> see you guys. Thanks. See you, John. Yep. Bye.